Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Ross Lockwood is taking us through. There's still plenty of room at the bottom, but just before that, I want to talk about Future Day, which as you know is March 1st, and there seems to be diminishing worldwide interest in Future Day. 2012, there were 15 events. In 2013, there were 12. So far in 2014, there are no listed uh, events at all on the uh, futureday.org page, which is very encouraging, suggesting that ours is going to be highly unique. So um, what I wanted to say is that we have decided to put together um, my interest in technology and the future of medicine and my cultural interest in um, Canadian iconic uh, poet, singer, songwriter Leonard Cohen's work. I uh, did Leonard Cohen birthday events starting in 2002. We did a big event at the Windspear 2008. And in 2016, we're planning on another big event. And uh, so we're planning in this future day to incorporate some of the people who are a part of that. And so that means in the world out there, if you've ever been part of the technology and future of medicine course, either teaching it or sitting in the seats and listening to it. Or both. Yes, or both, because we have people who have done both, that uh, you are most welcome at this party that we're having Saturday evening, March 1st. Also, if you've ever been part of any of my Leonard Cohen events um, or are part of the planned uh, 2016 event, you, you are most welcome at this party on March 1st. We're thinking that it would extend quite a long time, maybe from approximately 4 p.m. to midnight, but not all of you would be here during that whole time. And it would involve students from all the different terms in which we've taught the course, not just this term. Not every student from the present term is able to go, but it's kind of nice that we can have a lot of uh, interaction between uh, students that have taken this course over the entire uh, three years that it's been taught. So that's the plan, and those of you out there watching this video, I welcome your input, and I welcome your uh, participation. That could include remote participation. We believe that uh, Tori Sheldon and her boyfriend will be Skyping in uh, approximately between uh, four and five our time and maybe nine and 10 our time. But there's lots of other time for other people out there in other time zones to also Skype in as part of this Saturday, March 1st uh, event. We think it will be in this room, CCIS L1160, but we're not absolutely sure. Um, we think that the doors might be locked outside in the later part of the, the evening, but that might be okay if everybody was already here who wish to be part of the thing. So that's it. A any questions here? And we'll keep you informed about future plans for this. So Ross Lockwood, back to you and take it away. Sure thing. So just so you guys are aware, the, the doors lock people from coming in. They don't lock you from going out. So you can always escape. I do have access after hours if need be. I think I'll, I'll try and join you guys. So anyway, uh, you've heard the, the title here. There's still plenty of room at the bottom. And the funny thing about this talk, I just spoke to another graduate student and we had a big argument about uh, how far along the path we, that I'm going to talk about. So if I don't mention it during this argument that I had with this other student, Make sure you ask me afterwards, um, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more. So when, when we say there's still plenty of room at the bottom, we're referring to a talk that Richard Feynman gave in 1959 called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, in which basically all of modern nanotechnology uh, was founded. So 
he basically laid the roadmap down in that talk and went on from there. So I don't know if you guys have any history about who Richard Feynman is, but he's a very interesting person, no longer alive, unfortunately. Uh, but his life is full of very interesting anecdotes, and I'll tell you more about where to read about those in the future. So he was born in 1918. He attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he worked with some really famous historical figures, here pictured with Stanislaw Ulam and John von Neumann, the famous computer scientist. And his claim to fame in his early life was his work on the Manhattan Project. So Richard Feynman actually ran a department. Um, he worked with Hans Beeth, Neil Bohr, and Robert Oppenheimer, but he was, you know, very young at the time, in his 20s. And he ran one of the computing departments that was doing these calculations to try and predict the magnitude that a nuclear bomb would explode. And when I say a computing department, I mean an array of people who were assigned with small unitary tasks that would pass using cards onto the next person after they were done their calculation. So they had built a computer out of human beings that did a chain of calculations one after the other and just passed colored cards along to the next, next person. Um, he was actually present for the first atomic bomb test and they had handed out little UV goggles to everybody to protect their eyes from the blast. But Richard, being a physicist, knew that if he sat behind the windscreen of his truck, the truck would filter out most of the UV and that he wouldn't have to wear uh, these protective goggles. So he was one of the first people to actually witness a nuclear explosion with the naked eye. Later on in life, uh, and after some uh, very sad personal stories, he uh, worked in the Institute for Advanced Study where Einstein, Gödel, and von Neumann worked and uh, then went on to work at Caltech where he did his Nobel Prize winning, winning work on quantum electrodynamics. So that's his claim to fame later in life. Uh, and then finally, late, late in life, he was on the Challenger Explosion Investigation Committee in 1986 and he has this very famous moment where he dipped the SRB O-rings in a glass of ice water to demonstrate that they lose their resilience at low temperatures. And this was probably a factor that impacted the explosion that destroyed the shuttle. So if you want to learn a little bit more about Richard Feynman, there's a great book called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. And he's got many uh, physics and philosophy textbooks that are currently used today in my advanced quantum mechanics course here at the university. We used his quantum mechanics and path integrals uh, textbook, and it was fantastic. So on to the meat of the matter. There's plenty of room at the bottom. In 1959, this is when Feynman gave his famous lecture, considered to be the conceptual beginnings of nanotechnology. And he promulgated the idea that in the future, remember this is 1959, we'd be able to manipulate ind individual atoms and control their, their chemical sy synthesis by mechanical manipulation. And the way that he kind of envisioned this happening is that you would use current machining technology to build parts for smaller machining technology. And you would control that through some control mechanism and use it to build smaller, again, copies of the machining technology. And you keep doing this down and down the chain until eventually the machining technology that you're using is manipulating individual atoms. And that's not exactly how things went, uh, but at the time, that was kind of the idea that, that people had about doing this type of nanotechnology. So just to give you guys an idea, uh, the talk was in 1959. The first transmission electron microscope was introduced in 1939. A transmission electron microscope works basically the same way as an optical microscope, but instead of using light waves to probe materials, it's using electron waves. So it's accelerating electrons to high enough velocities where their, their wavelength is big enough to probe things on the atomic scale. Uh, in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. NASA was formed in 1958. Uh, the germanium transistor, the underpinnings of our current uh, computing technology, was invented and demonstrated in 1947, and that was followed by the silicon transistor in 1954. So these events are all just prior to the nanotechnology uh, revolution, 
1959, Texas Instruments commercialized the first integrated electronic circuit, so a circuit that had a series of transistors that did some job. And I picked out a quote that I think is uh, kind of the, uh, a good summary of what Feynman talked about in 1959. So I'll just read this out loud. As soon as I mention this, people tell me about miniaturization and how far it has progressed today. They tell me about electric motors that are the size of the nail on your small finger. And there is a device on the market, they tell me, by which you can write the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. But that's nothing. That's the most primitive, halting step in the direction I intend to discuss. It is a staggeringly small world that is below. In the year 2000, when they look back at this age, they will wonder why it is not until this, this year, 1960, that anybody began to seriously move in this direction. And it is a little bit strange. We do have the first kind of transmission electron microscope, um, some of the foundations of our co modern computer era, but why did it take until 1959 for someone to actually go and do the calculations that Feynman did? So I'll just, uh, we're gonna take a little break from the video as I show a YouTube clip which will appear online in the description of this video. And uh, it's, it's uh, Feynman recreating his famous 1959 talk in 1984 at a seminar, seminar called Idiosyncratic Thinking. And we're gonna watch from minutes 047 to 11 minutes and 15 seconds. All right, so that was a pretty interesting talk. Now, the content comes from 1959. That video comes from 1954. And there's some interesting things that he said in that video, which we can talk a little bit more about later. But the first thing is that when he was talking about the reverse electron microscope, to use that to write on the surface of something like the silicon wafer that uh, he showed there, uh, the technology for that had really not been perfected. And Feynman, in 1959, made two challenges. So I'm going to just, uh, well, let's go over this a little bit. This was another quote from the, from the talk that we didn't get to in the video. Um, but we're talking about writing with single atoms. And we're compressing the, the area of the entire Encyclopedia Britannica down to below the head of a pin. Um, I, I love the last part there. So there's plenty of room at the bottom. Don't tell me about microfilm. Microfilm, you know, you can transmit entire books on single sheets of microfilm or on single rolls of microfilm. Uh, but Feynman is really driving home the idea that you could do this with a grain of dust. You could do the entire content of all the knowledge of all humanity back in 1984, admittedly, on something that is just barely visible to the naked eye. And in 1959, Feynman uh, made two challenges to the world at the end of his talk. He issued a $1,000 prize for each. The first was to build a working electric motor that is 1 64th of an inch on a side and controllable from the outside. The second was to write a page of text in an area 1 25,000th smaller in linear scale. And that was what he said would enable us to write the entire Library of Congress on, uh, what did he say for the size there, on, on the, the cover of Time magazine. And it didn't take long before the first challenge was met in 1960. Uh, William McClellan demonstrated a motor less than 1 64th of an inch on a side, and Feynman begrudgingly awarded him the prize. It was very sad to Feynman because McClellan didn't invent anything new to be able to manufacture this. He got a pair of tweezers, a couple of toothpicks, and he made a motor. What Feynman really should have done is said 1 640th or 1 6400th on a side, or he could have gone even smaller than that. In fact, today's microelectrical micro mechanical devices are very, very small compared to this, and some of them uh, have the same functionality. The second challenge, now this is interesting, was met the year after Feynman gave the 1984 talk in 1985. And Tom Newman won this one by writing the first page, of, first page of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities using an electron microscope as predicted by Feynman on, on, the surface, on a silicon surface. I think it was on a, no, might not have been on a silicon surface. It might have been on something else. I don't have it in front of me. Now, my argument, and this is the one the graduate student and I had is that this isn't good enough, that 
what Feynman thought was fantastic, writing all the information from 1984 on a grain of dust in a 3D volume, is still not realized. But not only is it not realized, but we have a long way to go. And he showed us the picture of a 2D uh, microchip, one of the first microchips that uh, uh, started off the personal microcomputing revolution in 1984. And in the same year, in 1983, or the same year, plus or minus a year, um, there was an idea by a grad student at MIT named Danny Hillis to build a computer whose architecture was not the same as our current modern day microelectronics. It was called the connection machine. And uh, he envisioned a computer with a million processors each connected to each other. So very low power processing, but highly connected. And you can imagine this is an analog of the human brain. Each neuron doesn't have a lot of computing power, but it's connected to upwards of 1,000 other neurons, which means that collectively they can do fantastic things like me speaking, or you sitting there listening, and uh, he envisioned building a computer with this architecture. And uh, this will tie into Feynman, but it's kind of a, di a, di a diversion on the main topic that we're talking about today. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what they, what they did. And this is back in the 1980s. So they had two versions of the computer, the CM1 and the CM2. They had 65,000 processors that could simultaneously all perform calculations. So they're all independent uh, processors. And they put 16 of them on a chip, so they needed 4,096 chips. And Feynman was actually interested in this project after he gave that 1984 talk. And his job was to come up with a way to connect the processors efficiently. So what they did is they settled on a 12-dimensional architecture for the computer with each chip connected to 12 others. So not, not even close to what we see with neurons connected to other neurons. So I'll just go over what this 12-dimensional architecture means. So if you have two chips, they're connected by one connection, that's a one-dimensional object. If you have, oops, four chips, each connected, you've got a two-dimensional object, each connected to its nearest neighbor, I should say. Uh, and if you add four more chips, you can connect them by four more connections, you get a cube. So this would be kind of a three-dimensional analog of one of these computing units. They took one of these 3D cubes and connected each of its corners to the corners of another cube to produce a four-dimensional hypercube. So you can unfold this and show how many connections there are, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you can abstract that into symbolic representation by using one of these higher dimensional pipes. So that image there is a four-dimensional cube. If you take two of those, you can connect them by three more of these pipes and produce a five-dimensional cube. And you can see where we're going with this to six dimensions. And using those as corners of a cube, you get nine dimensions. And using those as corners of a cube, you get 12 dimensions. And this ultimately is the architecture of the connection machine. So you can see how um, if you had you know, one little processor at the corner of one little cube at the corner of one little cube, you could trace a route to another processor and send information to it along these higher dimensional pipes. And this is the t-shirt the that I'm wearing. This is the architecture of the connection machine. And there's the actual uh, commercial model that they produced. And in popular culture, this is the t-shirt you see Feynman wearing in Apple's Think Different campaign from 1998. The, the design itself is by Danny Hillis, the same graduate student, and it's just showing us the architecture. So this is one way in which we could make computers more powerful. And as it turns out, it was a really expensive project. Um, they used it to solve problems in quantum chromodynamics, but there isn't a huge market of people solving quantum chromodynamics, and there certainly isn't a market uh, for people that are solving quantum chromodynamics uh, on the scale that the connection machine needed. And in fact, Feynman actually simulated how this would work by hand. So as much as it would have been great to run it on the connection machine, the calculations could have been chugged through in a conventional computer um, in the same way that they could have been simulated by hand. Um, of course, there's other, th other programs that can run on this machine. Conway's Game of Life, if you guys have ever heard of it, that's the black and white grid where the uh, 
the nearest neighboring cells interact to say whether a cell is alive or dead in the next state of the universe. Uh, and that's you know, another really interesting uh, application of the connection machine because you can do these very large grids. Um, and Stephen Wolfram, the founder of Wolfram Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha, um, demonstrated a program which could calculate turbulent flow. Ultimately, though, conventional computers do the same job as this. The connection machine was uh, bulky and um, ultimately too expensive. But you probably have seen it in popular culture. Running in the background of Jurassic Park is, um, in fact, a quote by Dennis Nedry. Do you know anybody who can ne network eight connection machines and debug two million lines of code for what I bid for this job? Because if you can, I'd like to see him try. Uh, What's funny is that in the actual novel, they don't use a connection machine. Oh, you guys can barely see it, but it's there in the back. Uh, they don't actually use a connection machine in the book. They use, uh, uh, it's forgotten off the top of my head, one of the other supercomputers super of the time, but not one of these massively parallel ones. So that was a little digression. Let's get back to the main topic. There's still plenty of room at the bottom. So let's just compare two chips, one that uh, Feynman gave uh, picture of in his talk using optical lithography and a more modern one. And the difference between these two is probably a factor of a thousand in linear dimension. And that's a factor of over a million in area. So when we compare this, the optical lithography of 1984 to uh, the manufacturing processes that started running in the end of 2012 for the Samsung A7 chip, we're really getting down to manipulating groups of atoms. In the Samsung A7 chip, we're not, uh, each transistor still is 28 nanometers across, and atoms are still on the scale of angstroms. So we're, we're still a factor of about 500 times from getting down to the scale of the atoms. And in the meantime, there's all sorts of weird things that happen when we go down to those scales. So quantum mechanics kicks in. Um, groups of atoms behave differently than single atoms. So there's some struggle at the moment to make these chips smaller. And that's why when you buy a, a modern computer, instead of getting a 10 gigahertz computer, what, like you'd expect if back in 2002 we had projected forward the speed of computers to today, you're getting computers with four, eight, and uh, more cores. So we're making up for single core performance because we can't make transistors smaller by putting more cores on the same chip and doing more calculations in parallel than, uh, than we're doing in, in a linear chain. Um, and this is where things get a little interesting. So I'm going to talk about more modern technology. And one of the claims that Feynman said in this 1984 talk that I present is that you cannot write on an atom. And that today is an argument that's up for debate. Uh, of course, you can't write on an atom in the way that he suggested because you'd be using other atoms to write on it. But in the way that I'm going to show you in some of the research that's being done here at the University of Alberta and here at the National Institute for Nanotechnology, you can write on an atom by removing atoms from it and manipulating the atomic orbitals of those atoms. So I'm going to present to you some research by a researcher here called Bob Wolko. Interestingly enough, he was born in late 1958, so just about the time that Feynman was probably preparing uh, his talk. He graduated uh, with a Bachelor of Science in 1982, just about the time Feynman was preparing his lecture. And in 1987, uh, he graduated with a PhD and began his postdoc. And one of the important things that Bob Wolko did was he solved the silicon 111 structure. So this is if you take a big crystal of silicon and you cut along one crystallographic dimension plane, the 111 plane, you, you have a surface that faces upwards. And solving what the structure of that was uh, a problem for scientists back in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And now Bob Wolko works at Nint, where he does some really fascinating stuff. So. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what his research is. And I'm not going to show you as, as long of a clip as what I showed you for Feynman, so hopefully I won't bore you too much. But uh, the YouTube link will begin at 3 minutes 11 seconds, and it will go to 6 minutes 11 seconds. So what that video is showing is some of the more modern technology and what we can do. So rather than actually moving atoms around like Feynman suggested, which admittedly is quite tricky, 
the, the thing here is that you start with a pristine silicon surface that has hydrogen atoms capping each of the silicon atoms, and you can just go and pick off a hydrogen atom. So when I said you could write on an atom, I, it's really the absence of that hydrogen atom that is, is a writing mechanism. So you can do this. You could make a little font by picking you know, the, the stem of an L and then the other way around. And you could do the same thing as, uh, as the 1985 picture with Tale of Two Cities. But instead of writing with atoms, you're just pulling off hydrogens and leaving behind uh, these electron dangling bonds, which are very difficult to understand what they are conceptually. So if you have questions about those, I research them all day long. But what can you do with these things? So I'm going to show you two more videos, because this is where things really kick into high gear. And yeah, we got, we got another video lined up just in a second here. So the, the incredible thing about these is not only can you write with them, but they are underpinning a new revolution in in physics, where you're using them as computing elements. So when we talked about transistors being 28 nanometers across, now we're talking about computing elements that are analogous to transistors that are only an angstrom across, so a hundredth the size of our modern microelectronics. So still we're, we're in the linear dimension scaling that Feynman was talking about. We have not yet gone to the 3D scaling or the, the higher dimensional computer architectures like the connection machine but we're getting very, very small. And uh, one of the cool things that is later on in this video by Bob Wolko is with our human hands through the scanning tunneling microscope, we are not only manipulating atoms, we're manipulating electrons. And this is something that Feynman didn't foresee. He never, never foresaw anybody manipulating individual electrons to do the things that he was describing. So what can you do with them? Well, there's some fantastic cartoons that I'm about to show you. The animation that I just showed you uh, actually came out a couple of years ago. And it's very interesting. So when, we're, when he's talking about those bright spots on the surface, think of those as the chairs that the electrons are, were sitting in, actually. And that uh, the electrons can move from these sites, these dangling bond sites on the surface of this silicon. And they can make long chains of these. In the same way that they could write letters, they can write wires. Okay. And the cool thing about them is that you can also do things called quantum cellular automata. So this goes back to what the CM1 was computing. If you have a correct pattern of these things on a silicon surface, you can make things like not gates and AND gates, the basics of, of, and the fundamentals of computing. The trick is that you have to be able to interface them with the, the, the real world. And right now, they're trapped inside of uh, high vacuum systems, very pristine. Um, silicon surface systems, the kind of things that you see in sci-fi. Or if you walk down into the basement of CSIS here, you can see through the windows that there are these you know, big uh, aluminum enclosures that have windows and wires sticking in and out everywhere. Um, but you can do things like this, where you're taking a, a row of these atoms and intersecting them with another row. And you have what's essentially a field effect trans, uh, a field effect transistor. And in the bottom image here, I wonder if I can make that bigger. There we go. In the bottom image here, so you can see the, the, uh, in A, that's the four chair row of these tables. And in B, we have uh, a, a matrix multiplier. So you can take information from one side and information from another side and take the multiplication of those. Or in C, you can do a full adder. So you've got the underpinnings of this type of molecular elect electronics that fits in much smaller spaces than what we use conventionally. And this may be one of the ways that modern computing goes once we decide, well, we can't make transistors any smaller. Um, and the nice thing about this, like the video showed, is that the heat dissipation is not as big of an issue. Because here, you're not actually moving charges down a wire. You're just flipping them a couple of nanometers at a time. So the heat involved in processes like this is much smaller. Um, when we were talking about that mini motor, uh, we've got things in our phones today called microelectrical mechanical systems. These things are you know, what control the compasses. Um, so on the right-hand side, that big paddle is the iPhone 4's gyroscope. So um, those can still get smaller. Those are actually quite large by um, microelectrical mechanical standards. But of course, as they get smaller, they get more fragile. So we have to 
find ways of making them so that they don't break after a few years. And uh, no, I'm just kind of saying what, uh, what's the future of computing. So there's also quantum computing. And this is kind of different than what I was talking about with the dangling bond computers. So um, there's a Canadian company called D-Wave that has a process called, uh, oh, it's quantum computing, but it's uh, not quite quantum computing. They don't call it not quite quantum computing. They call it adiabatic quantum computing. And uh, these are actually, so as opposed to the CM1 computer, these ones are actually being purchased by big, uh, big companies like NASA, Google, and Lockheed Martin. And they're getting upgrades every year. And the uh, manufacturing is getting really good. So whether or not they're true quantum computers, um, there's still some debate. But in the next 10 years, we'll probably see things that are considered true quantum computers. And uh, that's a topic for another lecture. So what's the commonality between all of these things? So far, we've only talked about two-dimensional stuff. Feynman did mention that all the libraries in the world would fit into a grain of dust. But how do you do another layer of atoms on top of the existing one? And this is a problem that's not readily solved today. So you know, mark 2014 as the year that is analogous to, uh, to 1959 when Feynman talked about you know, uh, changing the linear scale. We still have one dimension that we can change the linear scale in, and that's the third dimension. Um, there has been work in this, though. Uh, in 2004, Intel made a Pentium 4 chip based on 3D architecture. And Samsung's now cur currently working on VNAND uh, solid state drives that have 24 layer structures. So we're getting to the point now where you can start stacking things up. The trouble is that heat dissipation from those types of systems, especially with conventional microelectronics, is very difficult. You need a way for the heat to get out, or you'll just melt the components together. So what are the future possibilities? Well, one possible uh, architecture would be using diamond. So diamond is a three-dimensional uh, array of carbon atoms. And there's actually uh, some really interesting research going on on something called the diamond NV center. So this is when you replace one of those carbon atoms in the network with a nitrogen. It leaves a vacancy behind. So that's illustrated as the V in that slide. And it actually has optical properties. So if you shine a laser in, that V center will absorb the energy and re-emit it as a different color. But that still doesn't really solve the problem of stacking. And I'm not sure what it might be. It might be that, you know, in the way that Feynman described building machinery that can build smaller machinery that, that can build smaller machinery, we might do something like start with one layer of carbon atoms called graphene and pick out the ones that we want to be our components and then lay down another layer of graphene and somehow force them together into the diamond configuration. Or we might assemble it one atom at a time with tiny nanomechanical manipulators and force each atom into the spot that it's supposed to be in. Uh, but at the moment, there's a big question mark on whether or not we'll actually see, see that in the next 10, 20 years. Um, so finally, I'll just mention a word that many of you may have heard of. It's computronium. What is the theor theoretical limit for computing? What is the theoretical limit for um, storing data? And, uh, you know, when you get smaller computers, what should you do with them? Right now, everyone's packing a computer in their pocket, and they're using it to check Facebook. Uh, are there better ways that we can use those devices? Is there a way, like we mentioned with, with just machines, or that Apple and Samsung are patenting these days, where your phone can actually do work for you uh, just by sitting in your pocket and measuring your activity during the day? So with that, I'd like to open the floor for some questions and leave you with this quote from Feynman. I'd hate to die twice. It is so boring, his last words. So any questions? Um, I think it, it's uh, instructive to realize that everything you talked about seems remote from the medicine of today, but there will come a time when this is crucial. For instance, the nano Laos, every lecture, uh, even Michael Woodside's lectures on uh, nanotech in previous terms, they always start with this fanciful, fictional picture
picture of the nano louse, which is this nanoparticle that has all sorts of motions and pincers and can do all this cool stuff. That really doesn't exist yet, but a lot of the things that you talked about today would be uh, necessary to understand to reach the point where you could actually have a working uh, nano louse. I know it's a very ugly term, but it's a very beautiful picture that you've all seen of this beautiful nanoparticle that doesn't you know, exist yet. And similarly, uh, uh, smartphone technology that we um, assume will be crucial to uh, medical care of the future, you know, involves many of the things that you were uh, talking about uh, today. So there will come a time, I don't know how many years from now, that every m medical student will immediately see, see the relevance of the entire lecture. Yeah, and we're already seeing some of the, the benefits of miniaturization. So just today, and I know like growing up, the popular science magazines would always have pictures of these little micro cameras that were shaped like pills that you could swallow, but it was nothing that you know, ever came to fruition. And just today, uh, in the news, there's the, uh, the FDA approved one of these things, one of these micro cameras that you can swallow, and it will check for uh, polyps in your colon. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is huge. This is, you know, maybe something that's a centimeter on a side. And just think about the camera that's currently in your cell phone. It's already smaller than this. Yes. But, you know, this is probably a lot more robust. You can't swallow <laughs> your cell phone at the moment. So there's technology that's involved in making, you know, these microelectronics uh, compatible with your body. And, you know, what's fascinating is my own research into, you know, silicon quantum dots is that quantum dots on their own are non-toxic, so you can actually inject them in your body and do work with them in right. ways that are, are kind of unexpected. And your body just metabolizes them, and they go away after they're done their job. Uh, toward the end of the teaching session that we had with the younger person, old, older person with uh, Rowa and uh, Abdul, Abdullah Salah, we were talking about uh, hormones, artificial hormones in, that robots would need in some sense. And I was asking what would they be built like, and they were saying that those would be nanoparticles. <laughs> it's not only biological beings that, that would contain these uh, nanoparticles, but when you wanted to give one of these artificial uh, hormones to a robot, that, that would be in, in the form of uh, uh, nanoparticles. Well, I don't you, just, know. you just think about the data transfer rates. I mean, yeah. right now at your home from your cable modem, you're getting maybe 100 gigabits per second max here in Canada, right? Well, you know, we're not talking about um, these Google fiber networks that they're putting in other cities around mm -hmm. the world. But, you know, if you've got a large hard drive, you can walk to your neighbor's house and transmit data much faster than you could across wires and across mm -hmm. optical cables. So it may be that the signaling uh, bits in robots are actually transmitting these dust-sized dust particles that Feynman was talking about that mm -hmm. contain information. Right, in the last five years, I think the information that humanity generates has doubled. I, I'm sure that there's a statistic out there that will back me up on this, but what kind of information is that? Because it's not the same quality as the Library of Alexandria, and it's not the same quality as the Library of Congress but it is the same quality as the human genome, and it is the same quality as the hormone signaling pathways that humans have in them. So it might take you know, one petabyte to really communicate the nuances to a robot of the way it should interact in a new situation, and if it's a nanoparticle that's used as the element to, you know, to, to imbue it with it, the analog of emotion, yeah. that, might be the, that might be the case. Right. So there is plenty of room at the bottom. <laughs> So, you know, guys, the purpose of my talking is to get you to want to talk. So there, there must be somebody now who wants to So I know that uh, this is your area of expertise and this is what you do in your day-to-day, -day, but um, Osmar Zayan talked um, a little bit about how Moore's Law is not seeming to apply in the same way uh, to software. 
how we've been getting smaller and smaller and faster and faster, but uh, he kind of views software as being the thing holding us back from the singularity. I was just wondering if you had something to add to that. Yeah, I think it goes back to the analog of modern computers versus something like the connected machine, that in general, software is done linearly. And you, know, you can talk about, the new Mac Pro is a great example of a machine that uses its GPU as um, a massively multiple parallel processor. So each little unit inside the GPU acts as an independent processor and does a little computation and sends the results forward to the next one. So he may have talked about that parallelization as the difference between conventional software and more modern software. And translating things like our human applications into software like that isn't easy. You know, what, in what way does Facebook parallelize in a way that that helps us as humans, right? We're at the, we're at the point where consumption media like, like TV comes into us as a linear stream. But when you start talking about things like video games where you want an AI to work, then you're having things like maybe as many as 1,000 units on a screen that you want to behave in concert. You're going to have to switch to a new software implementation that uses that network effect where each independent you know, being on the screen can do its own computations and can look at its own nearest neighbors and can, you know, update on the, refresh on the screen. So there is this, there is this shift towards more intelligent agents. And right now, one of the limits that software has is that our modern microprocessors are linear processors, right? Um, you look at most computers and they don't use their GPUs as parallel um, computing processors, but we're getting to the point where now, okay, you've got four cores in your computer. Think 20 years from now when that's going to be 4,096 cores, and each one of those is, is dedicated to an individual task for a computer, uh, like an agent on your screen. You know, what if, what if you gave the cursor of your computer a little bit of intelligence? What if you gave, you know, the Windows resizing algorithm a little bit of intelligence and let it kind of, you know, decide, well, the content that's on the screen is, you know, it's Facebook and it's kind of in a linear chain. So when I resize, I'm better off being, you know, off to the side in a linear chain like this. So, you know, the way that I see software going is, is gaining little bits of intelligence here and there that can be broken down into, into multi-core processes. So that's what I'd say about that. And I mean, like you said, I'm not an expert in the field, but there's all sorts of things that you can imagine happening that, uh, that would be wonderful. So you see sort of um, like with maybe a switch to parallel computing or a, like a, a drastic hardware change, you see like the software perhaps jumping at that point to a different like conceptual arrangement that we can't, I yeah. guess, fathom at this time. Yeah, that's probably um, the best way of putting it, that you know, if we really want to see software change, we're going to have to see computer architecture change. And we are slowly seeing that. You know, you do get uh, programs like Photoshop uh, and Pixelmator that are leveraging the multi-core processes. Um, and you know, your, your browser will do it too if you've got multiple tabs open. Uh, it, it could be dedicating one, one process to one of the tabs and another core to the other tab. Um, but we're still limited. I mean, you know, in the last 10 years, we've gone from single core architecture to four core in consumer electronics. So the question is, you know, with one to two to four core processes, can you really predict how a machine with 1,024 cores is going to affect the software that you're using? And you know, that's the kind of thing that you guys should be thinking about. That's the kind of thing that you're sitting in this class for. Because if you're not considering those things, then you know, the wave is going to wash over you instead of surfing on it. Anything, you can ask me about Mars. Mentioned at the end of uh, optimizing um, computing power of some of the devices, and now that we've started to assemble, like I myself have my phone, a tablet, a computer, maybe a net, like a home desktop computer, do you have more examples of how you can optimize computing power when it's not being used for? Like you mentioned health, 
like it tracks how much calories I burn by walking, but is there other examples of how you can optimize? Yeah, I wonder if it's, it's better illustrated by some of the patents that are being filed right now and some of the things that we were interested in doing is, uh, you know, if you, there's, there's obviously going to be privacy issues with all of this data collection that goes on, but, you know, so here's a good implementation of that massively parallel um, computing software that, you know, have you guys heard of PlayStation at home? So that's a project that uses idle PlayStations to do protein folding. And that has like a direct impact on medical research because if you can predict the shape of a protein based on the linear chain of it, uh, you can predict how it behaves in, in, in vivo, how you can, you can predict how it, how it alters biological structures and how it interacts with them. And uh, as far as, you know, like the fitness tracking revolution is kind of the next little one. There's a little hump. Everybody's kind of gotten bored of having a computer in their pocket, and they want to know what the next thing that it can do for us is. Because we're all happy to read Twitter. Uh, we're all happy to, you know, um, it, this doesn't get said enough, but we're all happy to use Skype and FaceTime to see the people that we're communicating with. I mean, when we were growing up, video phone was, you know, one of those things where we're like, oh, yeah, that would be fantastic. Do I really want to be seen by someone? But how often do you actually make a call with Skype? And it's, it, you benefit from it, right? Um, I'm not sure that I can really answer the question to satisfaction because it's one of those things that I'm, I don't know. It's one of those things that I want to know, you know? I wish that, uh, I wish that there was a clear path. I wish that somehow humanity you know, decided this is the next big thing. This is what we're going to do. Uh, but there's no overarching thing. And that's why people can still make money, right? Someone sneakily devises the next Facebook. And, or you know, Snapchat is worth how many billion dollars? And it's only because of the people that use it, right? So, so a lot of it has to do with human interaction. And I'm talking about all you know, the hard technology, the silicon atoms, and how they behave. But unless there's a human component to it, it's not going to find time in the consumer markets. It's not going to make a huge amount of money. It may never see the light of day. It may be stuck in vacuum tubes in the basement of some research facility. So you know, when you're thinking about these things, think about the impact that they have. What, what would it mean for you if you knew exactly what vitamin to take and exactly how it would change your five kilometer runtime. You know, if you had that fine granularity in, in knowing, you know, okay, if I eat this cheeseburger, what's my blood pressure gonna be all day tomorrow? You know, if, if it knows that I'm going to the gym Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you know, it, it could make recommendations to you. Do you really wanna eat that German sausage? There's something more tangible about fitness and uh, medicine that we never talk about, and that is physician fitness. If you talk to any personal trainer, they'll tell you that having a, a physician as a client is, is a nightmare. They don't, you know, follow any recommendations. They're, you know, arrogant. They, they don't do the right things. And in... In fact, I think that you, there's a lot of data now about the fitness of individual physician groups, you know, obesity, a lot of things. <laughs> it's, it, it's not just the influence of fitness on well-being outside, but actually within uh, medicine. And there's a really cool thing you can do. Most physician groups have bands. Somebody in there is musical and they have a YouTube video. And some physician groups, their bands are so sluggish, everybody looks out of shape and like unspirited and, and, and so on. So I, and, and the whole thing about sitting and the more that you sit in your work life, the sooner you're gonna die. There are a lot of you know, physicians sitting huge amounts of, of, of time. So uh, we, we can actually save lives amongst uh, physician groups by, you know, pushing these things. And, and, and uh, so we, yeah. I'd just like to add to that before you ask your question that, like, 
the revolution that's happening right now in the fitness world is, is really quiet and, and people don't seem to understand like, okay, I'm wearing a jawbone up, it's worth 130 bucks. Do you pay $130 um, to your cable subscription in two months or in one month? Like some people spend that much on sitting where one month's worth of that gets them one of these and you know, rather than a physician giving you advice, I've got a little stack of cards that you know, based on how I sleep and how I walk and how much time I spend running, it's giving me this little stack of advice. Okay, there's one for running, there's another one for running, here's one for sleeping, here's one for, oh, here's one for running, here's one for eating. And it's giving me this little stack of, of considerations that I should make to how I alter my life. So, you know, in five years from now, you might, you know, and my phone already has the M7 processor baked into it, so it's already counting how many steps I take. But that data is not currently being used by Apple, and it's barely being used. So the, the Jawbone Up does not integrate the data from the phone, even though the phone is with me more often than the wristband is. So it's one of those questions where when you get this massive integration, when you get something, you know, right now it fits on my wrist, in three years it's going to fit on a necklace. In six years it's going to fit in a grain of sand. In 10 years, it's going to be FDA approved to be injected in my eyebrow. So those are the kind of things that you really have to consider. You know, what benefits do you get from, from having that data readily available? Yeah, it's definitely um, an exciting frontier. But um, I'm just wondering, like, as we get this technology going and we implement it more stuff, like, say, the fitness apps, we implement it in our healthcare system, our government, everything, just store all the books, all the data. Um, the nanoscale seems like a very fragile scale to work with, though. Like, there's probably harms to physical damage, as you mentioned. And uh, I was wondering if um, there are currently like, researchers exploring avenues of uh, different ways to protect this data, because as we rely more and more on it, there's always the danger that we might lose what we put into it. Yeah, for sure. No, it's a, it's a big problem. And, you know, you guys should have backups. Do you have a backup? What's it on? Is it magnetic media? Is it a hard drive? Is it a tape drive? Is it an optical drive? Have you burned it onto a CD? Have you, you know, written down your address book somewhere outside of your digital realm so that you wouldn't lose it if, if, if the internet came crumbling down? Like, that's one of the risks of going into the future is that the networking that we're enjoying in this decade and in the last couple of decades that, that will go away, and there's legislation that threatens it every day. Um, I guess to answer the question on like the robustness of data is that you have to be personally responsible for your own stuff at the moment. Uh, but new technology comes with pros and cons. So you look at solid state drives versus hard drives, and do we really know how more robust a solid state drive is versus a hard drive for 10 year storage? So the, the, there's something that I guess is kind of predictable. You know, if you think of uh, military interests of the United States, one thing strategic for the United States is not losing the data that they have. So they have devised archival disks that are guaranteed to maintain data and be readable for um, at least uh, 100 years, and they've only been out there for about the last year. So now you can put all your data on something that will last uh, 100 years. As you may know, up until now, everything's been fugitive uh, media. I mean, if you create a, C a CD, uh, you know, DVD, it, it might last five years, but nobody knows, you know, in, in, in your lifetime, you have to keep stopping and copying everything too. So this, uh, you know, archival disk is a really, uh, useful thing. It isn't terribly sexy, but the idea of being able to put data on something that will last for uh, uh, 100 years is, is just a very practical thing. And, it, and, it's, and it's worse than that. I mean, if you look at your hard drive, if a cosmic ray manages to interact with one of the atoms in your hard drive, it could flip an entire bit. And it could destroy an entire picture as a result, right? These things happen all the time. So. You know, we're fighting against entropy here. And uh, I think ultimately it's the goal of industry to make more robust uh, methods of, of storing memories and storing data. But 
ultimately, it's, it's your job to, you know, when you've got two copies of something, you've really only got one copy. Because if one of them goes corrupt, then, then you're back to square one. Like, you, you should be, I, I, you know, this is a discussion that could be an entire lecture. But, like, you know, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a hard drive at work that I back my computers up to. I've got a hard drive at home that I back my computers up to. And right. I'm still not satisfied that that's enough. Because if a cosmic ray hits one of the backups and then my computer dies, when I restore from the backup, I'm restoring corrupt information. Yeah. Right? And there's no way for me to really know if, if what I'm doing is sufficient, ultimately, to, to preserve the things that I want to preserve. Yeah, I mean, I, I have, I guess, a total of about eight devices. Four of them are uh, mobile, and one is a laptop. And it seems ridiculous. I get the same stuff on most of them. But it's so comforting to think that if I lost one, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, back up something new from what I have on on the others or on the cloud. So, um, you know, we're we're ending up in a circumstance of massive uh, redundancy, and the old-fashioned single office with these huge monitors, where you might have three massive monitors, you know, this huge desk space where you can compute all sorts of stuff. But when you leave the office, you can't do anything. That's so limiting. Yeah. So I, I think the idea of multiple devices that when you would go out for, for an evening, depending upon what you predicted as the character of the evening, you decide what size, you know, configuration thing, what, you know, what apps it would need and all, the, all that sort of thing. But yeah. there, and there's also this generational change. What do you have of your great-great-grandfather? What data do you have of his? Do you have a photograph? Do you have a sketch? Do you have anything? Do you have anything that has, has come from two generations back? And I think the interesting thing that we're doing is we're creating this very rich archaeological <laughs> yes. thing. You know, when you die, put all your backups in your grave with you because they're better off there than with your family. What's your family going to do with them? <laughs> Okay, well, our, our time is up. Thanks for a wonderful teaching se session. Now, on Thursday, we have evil as a treatable disease, which is a very, very cool uh, teaching session. And then Ross is back next week for uh, nanotech. So uh, lots to look forward to.